A lot of people call this the Dr. Seuss house. First of all, nobody asked Dr. Seuss for permission to do that. They refer to that because of some of the um, ideas that Dr. Seuss had. I think he was a genius, and I think he did a lot of good for the world. I try and write poetry, and I kind of think of this as a poem to the sky. I am Philip Paul Widener. I'm the owner and builder of Goose Creek Tower. I went to MIT, and I'm kind of a frustrated architect, so I like building. I just designed it out of my head. We didn't have blueprints. We drew it out on cardboard, plywood, just as we were going. What I'm gonna end up doing eventually is put some hooks there and hang pots and pans off them, because this is the kitchen. I started to build a 40 by 40 scribe log cabin, and I realized I could put pillars on top and put another house on top of house. And I just kept going. We got to 185 feet and we stopped because um, 200 feet is federal airspace. Now I just have to finish it out. This is pretty much the last real stairs. There are multiple levels in there and I've tried to count them and it's just impossible. It depends how you count stories. I wanted to be able to see. And that's the reason I went up. You can actually see for um, at least 300 miles. And of course, um, when the northern lights are out, you can really see. I hope that Goose Creek Tower will inspire other people uh, to do worthwhile things, not just in building, but whatever they do with their life. And every time I go up there, it's a different experience. Kind of give you a sense of the um, enormity of the universe. A nest is a place where you have a sense of protection and strength. It's like an earth temple or a nature temple. The wood is following a pattern, but not one branch is the same. As a nest builder, I'm following those patterns. Most of the work is trying to bring out the best of those shapes with each other. I'm Jason Fan, and I'm a nest builder. I started building nests as a child. The nest building was really an intuitive process of just gathering branches and, and building forts originally, and the nest grew and got bigger and more elaborate. Now some of the nests are as big as 100,000 pounds of wood. The hardest part of building the nest is really gathering all of the wood. I use a chainsaw to cut wood. I use a machete to cut off all the excess leaves. And from there, I really assess, you know, what kind of shapes I have, what kind of material I have to work with. The construction process of the nest first is creating the foundation and the infrastructure. And then I follow those larger sculptural shapes that I bolt together with smaller material that I can weave in and around. I use every part of the tree, the, the trunk of the tree, all the way down to the very smallest twig and branch of the tree. I've gotten to where I'm used to building them on flatbed trailers and moving them around, and in many cases, I'm transporting them across the country. Because the nests are quite heavy, I use cranes and forklifts and different kinds of equipment. This is all eucalyptus. There's, there's over 75 different species of eucalyptus on this property. I've built around 50 nests all over the country, and now primarily I build the nests with kids within an educational setting. As an educator, like it's really important to work with kids and help them realize that they have the ability to shape and create an environment. I'm gonna show you how we can integrate those branches into the spiral. I love getting kids out into nature interacting with nature and, and the nest is actually very much a collaboration with nature. I know I've done a good job when it looks like the nest is something that could almost have grown out of the ground. Guédelon, c'est une aventure un peu folle au cœur de la forêt bourguignonne. 
depuis une vingtaine d'années, on a décidé de, de construire, pour comprendre, un château fort du XIIIe siècle. Le XIIIe siècle en France, c'est une période fabuleuse. Personne n'avait jamais construit de, dans notre monde contemporain de château du XIIIe siècle. Donc, de la première pierre à la dernière tuile, il va falloir qu'on apprenne. Nous sommes une équipe de 70 personnes, dont une quarantaine qui bâtissent ce château fort. On a annoncé 25 ans et qu'avec cette équipe, rien n'est impossible et les rêves les plus fous sont réalisables. Alors Guédelon, il est différent des autres châteaux qui sont dans le monde, tout simplement parce qu'il a été fabriqué au 21e siècle avec des moyens qui, eux, sont médiévaux, hein, avec des techniques qui ont 800 ans. J'ai fait une dizaine d'années de, de chantier un petit peu partout en France. Alors comparer Guédelon avec ce que j'ai fait avant, ça va être difficile parce que euh, Guédelon est un chantier qui est unique, en fait, c'est de la science, c'est de l'archéologie et euh, ça, ça me convient bien. Quoi. C'est un retour dans l'histoire que je trouve intéressant. Chaque petite pierre a été taillée. Chaque pièce de bois a été abattue à la main, écarie à la main, euh, tracée à la main par une équipe fabuleuse. Donc ça, c'est magnifique. Et donc là, il y a une énergie incroyable que je trouve complètement émouvante. On a un vrai château, en fait, et c'est nous qui l'avons fabriqué. Donc moi, je suis quand même super fier de ce qu'on fait. C'est quand même une super aventure. I live in Palo Alto, California, and it's a bizarre thing, I think, for people here to build things, physical things. Uh, most folks are doing dot-coms. It's kind of Neverland in Palo Alto, and so anything is possible. My name is Chris Robinson, and for four or five years I've been working on building the Tsunami Ball. It's designed to survive an inland tsunami. March 2011, Uh, there was an earthquake off the shore of Sendai in Japan, which caused a tsunami to uh, basically smash against the, the eastern seaboard. When the tsunami happened, I was at this incubator in Mountain View, and I was watching live footage of people trying to escape, and the entire office just starts discussing how they would fix that or solve that. And I, I decided then, well, you could very simply just put them in a, like a ping pong ball, right? Like a sphere is a very strong shape, and so you could usher your family into, and they would float around and they would be safe. And so I started just kind of modifying the designs, and at some point I just extruded the shape a bit, and now it's a capsule. Almost everything I'm doing here is brand new to me. I, I made mistakes from day one. And this was this piece that I custom designed to be super strong. And it's massively thick, right? It's four inches thick. But yeah, it twisted and just snapped in half. So this is what happened when the boat fell on me. You just hope that you survive the mistakes long enough so that you can make progress. Um, and then you, you can learn. The idea is that we'll have electric motors, uh, solar panels on the outside and batteries, and you'll be able to navigate from the boat. So it's not going to be a speedboat, but you'd be able to navigate your way wherever you need to go, back to shore or help somebody else that needs help. So we kind of share the same ideas about how to evaluate someone's project, and it's usually based on intelligence or money, time, and on those three things, this is the dumbest project you could ever do. And so I just think of it as an adventure. I'm excited every day that I'm out here working on it. The importance is just, just building it. The most recognizable thing in the sky is obviously the silhouette of the Spitfire. She's just a beautiful lady. I'm sure a lot of men would actually like to marry her. But I'm sure their wives wouldn't agree. There's 396 parts in a Spitfire seat. How do I know that? I built it. This is Martin Phillips. My name is Martin Phillips, and I am sitting next to my Spitfire, RR232, which I'm the proud owner of. Martin is obsessed with Spitfires. The big bombers join in pounding the shoreline. In the darkest days of World War II, 
Spitfires filled the sky above England. They are an icon, like freedom on wings. British kids make models of them. But Martin took his Spitfire devotion to a whole other level. For his 40th birthday, Martin's friends gave him a single Spitfire rivet. When I was presented with this rivet, the challenge was to go and build myself a Spitfire. So on the spare of the moment, not thinking, I said, right, I'll go out on the Monday morning and I will build a Spitfire. I never thought that over a period of 14 years that I'd probably wear three cars out with mileage along the journey to provide all the parts that you now see today. So fuel tanks, they came from Norway and Sweden. Some of the other parts came from Russia. Some of the parts came from Israel. Some of the other parts came from Holland, came from France. One of the wings was offered to us through a lost property department and another wing came through a little guy coming into work. He said, I've got a Spitfire wing in my garden. The man hours that go into a project like this, don't underestimate it. They are terrific. And I know the blood, sweat and tears that went into that. After 14 years, I know the question you're going to ask me. Do you fly it? Sadly, not. I am learning to fly and I hope one day to fly it. But greater guys than me fly it. My name's Matt Jones. I'm a Spitfire pilot. The modern airliners fly at 85% the speed of sound. They've got Spitfires flying at 96, 97% the speed of sound. You don't get in a Spitfire, you strap it on and it becomes a part of you. Because the aeroplane means so much to so many people, there are a lot of people who have gone down Martin's path and started thinking they want to build a Spitfire but I've never met anyone else who's completed it. He dedicated his life to finding the parts he needed to get this aeroplane flying again. I went through these 14 years, had heartache, and bits didn't fit. Just putting it together and finishing it and the provenance and the journey, the journey I went on, you know? Tears. Even today, I cry when it runs. It's just been amazing, absolutely amazing.